uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, let's, let's take a minute and go to Hebrews 10, 23. We've been talking about the faithfulness of God. I want to keep with this word this morning that God is faithful. I, I hope that you're, you're getting something from this. We'll probably wrap it up here in the next couple of weeks, but the, I want to continue the faithfulness of God. I read a story, uh, actually a book several years ago, but it was about the sinking of the USS Indianapolis, if you know the story. It was at the last maybe month or so of, the, uh, of World War II. There was 1,100 men on board the USS Indianapolis when the Japanese hit it with a torpedo and sunk it. And it, they hit it in such a way that this ship went down, I mean, just completely sunk in 11 minutes. I mean, it just ripped a huge, massive, almost ripped the ship in half. And um, there was, again, 1,100 men on board, 900 men made it into the water. But because it sunk so quickly, they didn't have time to get the life rafts out. They didn't have time to get the supplies out. They just had to jump overboard. Some of them had life jackets, some of them didn't. The radio was damaged in the attack. Again, it was so quick, they couldn't, they couldn't get out a, a, a SOS, a, a message, a distress call. And, and uh, they weren't where they were supposed to be. They had taken a little different uh, route for a different, for some reason they hadn't radioed in their location. Nobody knew where they were, nobody was looking for them. So if you can imagine being one of those men floating in the water, maybe you've got a life jacket, maybe you don't. And what I didn't realize was, after a short period of time, maybe, maybe after a day or so, I guess that's not short, but a day in the water, those life jackets start to lose their buoyancy. So even if you had one, at some point pretty quickly, it becomes useless. In fact, they, a lot of the guys had to take them off because they began to weigh them down. So for four days, these guys floated in the open ocean. Sharks, it says the sharks were constantly circling them. There's an estimate about 200 of them were killed by shark attacks. Others were injured in the attack. They weren't strong enough to keep afloat, and they died from exposure. Um, and a lot of the guys, you know what? They just gave up, if you can imagine. Four days of treading water, four days of floating. How long can you? And a lot of the guys just gave up. Some of, them, some of them got so thirsty, they had no supplies. Again, they got so thirsty, they just drank the salt water. They knew it would kill them, but they just, it's like having all this water all around, but none to drink. They just drank some and, and quickly died. One man said this, he said, I've been swimming for so long that finally, he said, I started to whisper to myself, I'm going to die. And he said, it just felt so good to finally say the words. He said, I just started to scream, I'm going to die. They finally were rescued. A plane that was sent to, to look for subs happened to see them, and 316 of those 900 men that went into the water were saved. And what stuck with me were those words, that it felt so good to say, I'm going to die. It felt so good, really what he said, it felt so good just to give up. And we've been reading this scripture, Hebrews 10, 23, let's hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And you know what struck me is the parallel with that story. You've got a confession of hope, but sometimes you feel like you're swimming and you can't keep your head up. Sometimes you feel like you're going through something in life and it just, it just feels like you're struggling just to stay afloat and it would just be so good just to give up. It would be so easy just to give up, but he says, let's hold on to the confession of our hope. And what I want you to understand is those guys that kept swimming, their, their deliverance came, but it took longer than they expected. But some of them gave up just before they saw the deliverance. And what I want you to understand is your victory is coming. You just got to hold on to your confession. Don't give up. See, some people give up too quick. So hold on to the confession of your hope without wavering. Remember, your confession, your confession of hope is your faith declaration. So it really it represents your faith. What you believe on the inside has got to be what comes out of your mouth. If it's not coming out of your mouth, then, then, then you don't really believe it. So he says, hold on to that confession. Don't let go. So I want you to see this because he says, he says, because God is faithful. He who promised you is faithful. And so we've been talking about the faithfulness of God, and I want to continue with that this morning. 
Romans 15, we've been sharing the scripture, whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction so that through, through the scriptures we might have endurance and encouragement. God wants you to be encouraged today. He wants you to have endurance so you don't let go, you keep going. And so I wanna, I wanna jump into this story this morning. We've been talking about, we talked about Abraham. We talked about Moses, right? We talked about Rahab. I think last week we talked about Gideon. I wanna look at this Hebrews eleven thirty two. He says, what can I say? I don't have time to talk about Gideon and Barak and Samson. And I want to talk a little about Samson this morning, and it's a, it's a familiar story. You know the story, but I, I want you to look at it this morning from this perspective of the faithfulness of God. And that's maybe not a story you look at too much about God's faithfulness. It just looks like a story of a guy who made a lot of bad mistakes, okay? But listen, in the middle of that, that story, the faithfulness of God is all through here. I want you to see it. So again, don't, don't quit. Um, so this, this story, just like Gideon last week, Israel was in this cycle, right, of blessing of God. And then they turn to idols, they sin, God, God kind of pulls away from them and they fall into oppression from the enemy. And it's like back and forth, in and out of this, this cycle, the enemy comes. And so at this point in the story, they've gotten away from God. Now the Philistines are ruling over Israel, you know, the famous Philistines, like Goliath, the Philistine. And they've been oppressing Israel for 40 years. When we pick up the story, I want you to go to Judges 13, verse 2. It says this, there was a certain man from Zorah, from the family of Dan, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was unable to conceive. She had no children. The angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, it's true that you're unable to conceive and have no children, but you will conceive and give birth to a son. And he gives her some instructions about this boy. He says, please be careful, don't drink wine or beer or eat anything unclean, for you're gonna conceive and give birth to a son. You must never cut his hair, because the boy will be a Nazarite to God from birth, and he will begin to save Israel from the power of the Philistines. So God sends this angel to come to this woman. Hey, you're going to have a son. We know you can't have children, but you're going to have one, and he's going to begin to deliver Israel. And what I want you to think about for a minute, how long was it going to be from that point to the point where Samson would step up and begin to do what God had called him to do? I mean, you're talking, she, had, she wasn't even pregnant yet, okay? And sometimes it feels like a long time. When you're a parent, it feels like your kids are young forever, and then suddenly they're not, right? Suddenly they're not. You turn, you blink, and now they're driving, and hey, what's going on? And it's crazy, but that, it just, it's a long time. It's a process. So she's not even pregnant yet. Maybe Samson in his 20s is going to begin to deliver, deliver Israel. Maybe he's 30. So you're talking they have to wait another 20 or 30 years before Samson steps up and does what he's called to do. What I want you to catch is this. Israel, I don't believe Israel was ready for deliverance yet. Because if they were, God would have sent somebody at that moment, just like he did with Gideon. Israel wasn't ready yet. They were still in the middle of the cycle. But God could see down the road, and he said, ooh, they're gonna be, they're gonna be pretty soon turning to me. They're gonna be pretty soon looking for deliverance. They're gonna be calling out to me. I better get somebody ready. So before there was ever a need, he sent Samson. Before they, before they even needed deliverance, he was preparing Samson. Listen, this is the faithfulness of God at work in your life. Before they're even ready, God's doing it. Listen, what I want you to catch is before your need ever existed, God already prepared a solution. Before you ever saw a problem coming, God already made a way out. Amen. Amen. Before, before you ever hit the financial crisis in your life, God already made a way. Before you ever needed healing, he sent Jesus. While you were still a sinner, he sent Jesus on the cross. Come on, that's because God could look down the road and he said, I need to send a deliverer. I need to make a way out. He saw your problem before it ever existed. Listen, he's already got your deliverer. That's the kind of God he is. He's already made a way. He's already got your deliverance all set up. He's got everything set up for just the right time. 
That's his faithfulness at work. Before you needed it, when you didn't deserve it, right? When you hadn't done anything to earn it, he made a way. So God prepares Samson. He tells his mom, don't, don't cut his hair. He's going to be a Nazarite. That means he was a Nazarite vow. It wasn't the same as, as Jesus from Nazareth. Okay, so some people get the idea Jesus was a Nazarite and he must have had long hair. No, he didn't have long hair. In fact, it says in the Bible men should cut their hair. Okay, I'm just putting that out there in case you're young people. Um, but he was, a, he was a Nazarite. So Samson was a Nazarite. He had to follow certain rules. He couldn't cut his hair. He couldn't. One of the rules was you couldn't drink wine. In fact, it even says you couldn't, you couldn't eat the grapes. He wasn't even really supposed to touch the grapes. They were unclean for him because he's set apart from God. Now, I want you to see this because that's important. Look at this story, Judges 14. So Samson's grown up now. He goes down to this place, this town called Timnah with his father and mother. And now at this moment, his father and mother are not with him. It doesn't say that explicitly, but it does later in the story that they, he doesn't tell them what happens. But he goes down to Timnah, and he, he comes to the vineyard there. Remember, you're not, he's, he's a Nazarite. He's not supposed to drink wine. He's not supposed to eat grapes. He really shouldn't even be touching the, but here he is in a vineyard. What do you think he's doing in the vineyard? And Samson, his whole life, he wrestles with temptation, doesn't he? So here he is. He's in a place he's not supposed to be. He's looking at the forbidden fruit, okay? He, I'm not supposed to eat this, but man, it looked good. I, he might have been eating some. I don't know. It'd be hard to be walking through a whole vineyard full of grapes and not want to taste one, wouldn't it? Not want to. I wonder what it feels like. I'm not supposed to touch. I wonder what that great, oh, it's squishy, you know? What, I, wonder, I wonder what it tastes like. Maybe there are muscadines. You know, man, those are good. I've got some in my yard. So, so Samson, he's in this vineyard, and suddenly a young lion came roaring at him. So again, Samson is in a place he's not supposed to be, hanging out with things he's not supposed to be doing, wrestling with his temptation. God has a call on his life, but he's struggling because the world is calling to him, right? The world is calling to him. So he's in a place he shouldn't be when a lion comes roaring at him. And I think it's interesting because the devil's called a roaring lion, isn't he? He goes around like a roaring lion, Put that verse up there, 1 Peter 5, 8, be serious. Come on, be serious now. Be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. And he says in verse 9, resist him. I was, I was reading about lions roaring, right? And it's... It said you can actually hear a lion roar for several miles away. So if you were right up in front of a lion and it starts roaring, it, it would almost deafen you. It'd be like a gunshot going off next to your ear. It's so loud. So it, it would, it, it was a, it was a, really, it's meant to intimidate, isn't it? The roar, a lion's roar is meant to intimidate it's meant to strike fear in your heart, right? You've seen videos of lions laying around all day. Yeah, in Africa. They just they don't look like they do anything. It's like my cat. Every time I see my cat, it's sleeping. But when I'm asleep, my cat's on the prowl. And I, I know it because I come out in the morning and there's the there's what it, there's the kill. There's another bird. There's another mole. There's another mouse. It just it kills everything. They're active at night, and lions are most active at night. In fact, one, one article I read said they roar almost exclusively at night. So this is, I think this is interesting because, again, if the, if the parallel is the devil's like this, what's he doing? He's waiting until that moment when you feel alone, when it's dark and you feel a little afraid, where you're going through something and it's a dark time in your life, and he starts to roar. And you know what that does? That starts to bring up some fear, doesn't it? Ooh, I'm all alone. I don't know where the roar came from, but I heard it. 
And you start to get a little fearful. And so I think that's what it's saying. The devil's, he's on the prowl. He's waiting till it's dark. He's waiting till you're alone. And the roar is meant to scare you. Look what it says in first, uh, not first John, in John 10, 10. We open the service with this. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. See, the devil wants to come and steal and he wants to come and kill and he wants to come and destroy your life. And that's why it said in 1 Peter, you better be serious and be alert and resist the devil because if you don't resist, he's going to get you. And I'm not trying to scare anybody, but listen, that's why he says in the word, you got to learn how to stand. You got to learn how to hold on to your confession. You cannot give up your confession, church. You have to learn how to keep swimming even when it's tough, because the enemy waits till that time that you feel weak and you feel like you've been swimming for three and a half days and it feels like your deliverance is never coming and the enemy comes in and he comes in roaring and you start getting afraid and you let fear take over. No, no, you hold on to your confession, church. See, if you let go of your confession, you give the enemy permission to attack. But as long as you stand in faith, he cannot touch you. Listen, as long as you are standing in faith, the enemy can't touch you. As long as you're believing, standing on this word, there's nothing he can do but roar. But when you let go and you say, well, maybe I am going to die. Maybe I am, maybe I am this. Maybe I am, I'm not going to make it this time. Now you've given the enemy permission to attack because you let go of your confession. He says, don't let go. That's why he says, put on the full armor of what? Of God. Come on. The, the helmet of salvation, anybody. The breastplate of righteousness. It talks about all this armor we have. And it's, if you read through the list of armor, you've got things that cover your head, things that cover your chest, things that cover down here, the sensitive areas, your legs, your, your, your feet. But I don't read anything about your backside. Am I right? There's, there is no put on your back plate of, of, you know, peace or something. There's none of the back stuff. You know why? Because you're supposed to be facing your enemy, not running away. If, you, if, you, if you're facing a lion, we'll do a little worst case survival scenario. If you're facing a lion, I think probably the worst thing you could do is turn around and run because that animal has an instinct. And what's the instinct? Oh, I got a chase, right? You turn around and run, and now that thing is after you, and you've got no protection. That's why you face the enemy head on. You're supposed to be standing. You're supposed to be standing in faith with your armor on, with your shield of faith, with your sword of the Spirit. Come on, you get that stuff on. The enemy can't touch you. So that's why he says, keep standing, stand and keep standing. Hold on to that confession. Don't give up. Because as long as you stand in faith, listen, the devil can roar all day, but he can't do anything to you. Nothing in this world can touch you. All he has is the, the weapon of fear, but there is, no, there is no bite to his bark. But if you turn around and run, no, he's got you where he wants you. yeah. So look what happens in the story, verse 6. The Spirit of the Lord took control of him. And Samson, it says, he tore the lion apart with his bare hands like he might have torn a young goat. I've never tried to tear a young goat. I can't imagine the disgusting image that it just gave us. But I suppose it might be easy enough that somebody could do it. So Samson, if you can imagine, took this, this lion probably lunged at him, and he just ripped the, th- I just imagine the, whole, the lion ripping in half, arms popping off or something. It's just disgusting. We just made it a whole another PG-13 sermon. But it was, it was a supernatural thing. Catch it. It was a supernatural thing. It says the Holy Spirit came on him. And when the, when the Holy Spirit came on him, and the lion came roaring, Samson just rips him in two. And I I believe it shows something. It's a graphic picture, but it shows something how powerful Christ in you is. Okay? 
The enemy might come one way, but what's the word say? He's going to flee seven ways, right? Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So if the lion is a picture of the devil and Samson's a picture of a, a man or woman born again with the Holy Spirit of God on him and the, and the devil comes roaring, you just rip him. You, that's the picture. How much greater is Samson versus the lion. I mean, it's no comparison. It's a complete blowout. That's you with Christ on the inside against the devil. So you have no reason to turn around and run because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. But again, listen, Samson was in a place he shouldn't have been when that roaring lion showed up. Am I right? But God was still faithful in his life. And maybe today, listen, some of you might be in a place you shouldn't be. You might be doing things you shouldn't be doing. You might be thinking things. You might be, you know, in, in involved in things you should not be involved in. And you've made, some of you, might, you know, some people make a mess out of their lives. But listen, God is still faithful in your life if you call out to him. It doesn't matter how messed up you've gotten, he'll still be faithful if you'll call out to him. He can't deny himself, amen. But even sometimes, even if you're in a good place, the enemy shows up. But all you gotta do is stand, church. You just keep standing. And you know the rest of the, you know more of the story. Samson, he, he just, the spirit of God comes upon him. It says that multiple times in this, in this story. The spirit of God comes on him and he starts going after the Philistines. I mean, he's attacking them left and right. At one place, they get so mad, they come and they want to arrest him. Well, I don't know why they think they can arrest him because they, nothing has worked yet. But they come to where he is and, and they tell the people that are living in the town, the, the Jewish people living there, they say, bring us out, Samson, or we're going to kill all of you. So they go to Samson. They say, you better, you better come on out. He said, okay, tie me up. Take me out. They tied him up. They brought him out to the Philistines. When they got him out there, it says the Spirit of God comes on him. He just breaks all the ropes. He picks up a donkey's jawbone. A dead donkey was laying there, and he kills a 1,000 people. So he is, he is the number one wanted man, okay? They want this guy. They know something supernatural is happening, and they can't stop him. Listen, nothing could stop him right? Nothing could stop Samson. There wasn't a person on this earth that could stop him. The devil couldn't stop him. He tried to send wild animals. He tried to kill Samson. Listen, nothing could stop him. I want you to catch this. Nothing can stop you. But there was one thing that could stop Samson, and it was Samson. There's one thing that can stop you. That's you. You let go of your confession. You keep standing, church. Listen, so let me, let me keep going with this story here. He starts hanging out with Delilah, you know that. He puts himself constantly in places he shouldn't be, doing things he shouldn't do. The Philistines paid her to find out Samson's secret. They understood this was something supernatural, so Delilah seduces Samson, and she looks sweet and innocent, right? And, and maybe must have been pretty or whatever, but she was, uh-uh. And she said, tell me your secret. But Samson doesn't trust her at first, does he? He's not as dumb as he looks. You know, I think sometimes we read this story and think, man, he was stupid. And he did some stupid things, but I don't think he was ignorant. He knew what was happening here. He just didn't care. He was okay hanging out with the enemy he was okay sleeping with the enemy because he thought, man, it's okay. I've got, I've got the Holy Spirit's with me. I can, I can hang out in these places. I can do these things. Nothing matters. He just didn't care. So she said, tell me your secret. He doesn't trust her. So he starts making up these stories. If someone ties me with some fresh bowstrings, I'll become weak like an ordinary man. She ties him up and calls the Philistines to come get him. And she says, Samson, the Philistines are here. He, he wakes up, he breaks it all off, and he goes and he beats them all up. You know the story. And she goes again, she's crying. Why don't you love me? Why don't you just tell me the truth? He lies to her over and over and over until he can't stand it. She just has wore 
him out. And again, I don't think he was that stupid. You can't have that happen over and over and over again and think this was a coincidence. He just got to a place where he didn't care. He was sleeping with the enemy and he knew it. And listen, there's a lot of Christians who have given the devil room in their lives. Don't, listen, don't let the devil whisper in your ear because he wants to whisper in your ear and get you to quit swimming. He wants to get you to a place where you give up. He'll whisper, come on, he'll whisper sweet nothings in your ear to get you to turn around and run. But if you let, all he wants is for you to let go of that confession. And this was, I believe this, this story here is about getting Samson to a place where he just didn't care anymore. He's like that man who was swimming and he said, it just felt good. It just felt good to give up. And I think this is Samson giving up. This is Samson being worn down constantly by the enemy. And if listen, if you let the enemy start whispering in your ear, if you give him room, he'll put you to sleep on his lap. And the next thing you know, you're saying what he's telling you and you're believing what he's saying. Don't let go of your confession because he's faithful. So look at this story now in verse 19, Judges 16, 19. She let Delilah, let him fall asleep on her lap. She called a man to shave off the seven braids on his head. I guess he had dreadlocks. In this way, she made him helpless, and his strength left him. And she cried out, Samson, the Philistines are here. When he woke up from his sleep, he said, I'll escape as I did before. I'll shake myself free. But he did not know the Lord had left him. He didn't know the Lord had left him. Verse 21, the Philistines seized him. They gouged out his eyes. And they brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles, and he was forced to grind grain in prison. So this girl put him to sleep, shaved his head. It says she made him helpless. She made him weak. Yeah? The enemy, the enemy came, and he couldn't do anything about it because he didn't know the Holy Spirit had left him. And the enemy takes him. They take his eyes out, and they make him a slave. I noticed I was, somebody, I was talking with Joseph the other day about the Bible, children's Bible stories, you know, and some of the little children's Bibles we have, they always leave this part out of the story about gouging out the eyes. I don't know why they do that. So I make sure, I make sure to fill my kids in when there's something missing. But I, I do, yeah. And um, so the enemy, they gouge his eyes out, they make him a slave. But I, I want you to understand this because this is how the devil operates. I think this story, it's a, great, it's a great example of what the devil does. He puts people to sleep, okay? The enemy knows there's on, the only way he can touch you is to get you weak. He needs to get you, listen, out of the presence of God. He gets you out of the presence of God, out of fellowship with God, and what happens? You're disconnected. You become weak, you know? I'm not saying you're not a... A Christian, well, I haven't been praying like I should and I haven't been reading my Bible. It doesn't, I'm not saying you're not a Christian. What I'm saying is you're not, you're not having that fellowship. The only time you're strong is when you're, when you're connected with him. You see what I'm saying? So the enemy comes to seduce you, to whisper in your ear, to distract you. And if you're not careful, you'll start listening to him and you'll quit swimming. So the enemy took Samson, they took his eyes out. Look what it says about The devil in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, it says, In their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. He's talking about the devil now. The devil has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. This is what the devil does. He blinds people. He doesn't want them to be able to see because if you can see, you'll recognize what you're doing is not right. You'll recognize what you're doing doesn't make sense. You look at this world today and some of the nonsense that's going on, and the reason the world is okay is because they're blind. If they could see, they would look around and be like, wow, what am I doing? This doesn't make any sense. This is terrible. But they're so blind, they they just can't see what they're doing. It's not necessarily their fault. The devil's blinded them. That's why you need to pray the blinders come off. 
Because if they can start seeing, listen, there's going to be revival breaking out because now they can see the glory of God in their lives. They can see, the glo- they can see God's doing something. They say, I want that. I want what you got. You with me? So the devil doesn't want people to see the mess they're in. He wants to keep them in slavery. He doesn't want them to see there's a way out. So I want you to see how the devil operates because, listen, church, we're called to stand. We're called to stand. So for Samson, he woke up and he did not know the Lord had left him. He didn't know he had become weak. He didn't realize how the enemy had seduced him, how he had gotten away from the presence of God. But in the midst of all this, God hadn't given up on him. And I think that's the most powerful thing in this story. As as much of a mess as Samson made of his life, God was still there for him. You know, uh, you look at, this story is amazing to me because there's never been anybody before or since that was like Samson, that had the kind of, I mean, God just came on him in supernatural power, I think, to show us what's possible in him. To show us that it's not about our strength, it's about his strength. But God had such a call, such an incredible call in his life, but Samson just made a mess of things, didn't he? All the time, all the time. But God had not given up on him. Let me finish the story, I'm getting ready to close. Verse 25. The Philistines are having a celebration, they're having a, um, one of their big festivals. They're all inside of this great, big, enormous temple to their God that they're worshiping during this festival. It says in verse 25, when they were drunk, they said, bring Samson here to entertain us. They wanted to come have him so they could laugh at him. They brought Samson from prison and he entertained them. They had him stand between the pillars. There was these pillars that supported the temple. You know the story. The two, two main pillars, they had him stand between those. They made a mistake. The temple was full of people, about 3,000 of them. Verse 28, Samson calls out to the Lord, Lord God, please remember me. Strengthen me, God, just once more with one act of vengeance. Let me pay back the Philistines for my two eyes. Samson took hold of the two middle pillars supporting the temple, and he leaned against them, one on his right and the other on his left. Samson said, Lord, let me die with the Philistines. He pushed with all his might. And the temple fell on the leaders and on the people in it. And the dead he killed in his death were more than those he killed in his life. And it's a sad, tragic ending, but listen, God did not leave him. Well, he left him for a time. The Holy Spirit left him, but God didn't forget about him. God was still faithful to show up in his life when he needed him. And even when Samson walked away from his purpose, right? He walked away from the call that God had for him. God was still faithful. And I don't, I don't know if you're here today and you'd say you're far away from God. Maybe somebody here, you feel like you've made some mistakes in your life. You feel like maybe you've made a mess of things. You've been running. It feels like the devil's been chasing you, devouring your life. It says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I want you to know today God's faithful. The, I didn't read the end part of that verse, John 10, 10, if you can throw that up again there. The thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy, Jesus said, but I've come that they might have life and have it in abundance. Jesus came to give us life. He said, look, there might be a devil who's come against you and he comes to steal and he comes to kill, he comes to destroy, he comes to seduce you, to get you out of, out of, uh, out of right standing with God. He comes to do all this stuff in your life, but I came to give you life and have it in abundance. Jesus came to give you life so you could live above everything the devil tries to do. Listen, this world is full of problems, isn't it? Life can be full of problems. There's all kinds of things that could go on in your life from, you name it, sickness and disease, you, you, financial problems, I mean, family issues, marriage problems, all these things in your life that seem to pile up. But Jesus said, I came so you could live above all of that. I don't want you struggling through life. I don't want you fighting. I don't want you just trying to keep your head above the water. I want you living on on top. When Jesus came, he walked right on top of the water. He wasn't struggling through the winds and the waves. He walked right on top. That's what Jesus does. And he says, I've come so you can have that kind of life. Listen, maybe today 
you're in a place where you need to, you need to see his faithfulness. Maybe you've been away from him. Listen, you turn to him. It doesn't matter where you've been. He'll embrace you. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. He's like that, that father waiting for the prodigal son to come home. The father didn't stand there saying, son, I can't believe you did this and you did that and you spent my money and you, you, you were you no good, lousy. That's what he was expecting. That's what that prodigal son was expecting. But the father stood there and he embraced him, didn't he? And he said, bring out a robe and put a robe on my son. Bring out the, the ring that represented the family. Put that on his hand because my son was lost, but now he's found. That's, what God, that's how God is. That's his great faithfulness in our lives. Why don't you stand up with me? And I want to pray for you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? Maybe you're here today and you'd say, yeah, I've never known the Lord like you're talking about. I've never had that kind of relationship with him. I've never, I've never seen his faithfulness in my life. And today you want to turn to him. Maybe you're here and you say, I've made a mess of my life. Listen, he's there waiting for you to turn to him. If you're here this morning and you need to give your life to Jesus, why don't you raise your hand right where you are and I'll pray for you. If you're watching online today, just lift your hand to the Lord. You need to do that. Just pray with me. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me for my sins and make me a new person. I give you my life, Jesus. Take my mess, take my problems, take everything, Lord, you have it all. Lord, I thank you for blessing in the name of Jesus. Let me talk to the rest of you today for just a moment because maybe there's some things going on in your life and it seems like the enemies come against you. But listen, as long as you keep standing in faith, you keep holding on to your confession, nothing can stop you. I want to pray for you now. And if you need prayer for, for anything further, I want to invite you to come to the front. We'll be happy to pray with you and, and just stand with you, keep speaking your confession with you. But let me just pray for the rest of you right now. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we say, have your way in our lives today, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for the confession that our hope is in you, Lord, because you're faithful. And today, Lord, whatever it might be that we're holding on to, that we're believing for, Lord, I thank you for that good confession. I thank you for encouraging each one today, Lord, that they'll leave strengthened and encouraged, and Lord, just believing you for even greater, because you've come to give us life and life more abundantly. I thank you for it, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We're going to close with this song. This morning, I just invite you to sing with us. If you need prayer for anything, come on up while we're singing. Joseph asked me to announce if your youth are going to camp, your deposits due today. So um, see him for some information about that. Let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you for your goodness, 
your faithfulness, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives. Lord, we just bless your people now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for just having your hand upon them, for your anointing to be on them. Lord, that you've got good in store for them today, and we just thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. God bless you this morning. I uh, hope we see you at Vacation Bible School this week.